Welcome to Business Revolution. Business Revolution is an idea sharing platform where budding and experienced entrepreneurs share the business tips, the pros and cons, the do's and don'ts of how they built their businesses to where they are today. Today we have Mr. Gerald Otim of Ensibu Co. This is Business Revolution. Welcome, Gerald. Thank you. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you for making the time. Sure. Would you like to start by telling us a bit about who you are and where you've come from? Uh, so my name is Gerald Otim. I'm the founder and CEO of Ensibuko. We are a Ugandan fintech, what you'd otherwise call a financial technologies company. We start up. We started in 2014, so we're making five years in October. Wow, this year. congratulations. Thank you, thank you. So Ensibuko builds uh, financial solutions for the microfinance sector. So we have a core banking system that microfinance organizations use to automate literally everything they do from how they profile their customers or their members to how they process payments, savings and loans and things like that. And then we have integrated this platform with other payment platforms like mobile money. So now people that use microfinance entities can be able to use mobile banking services to transfer funds between their mobile wallet and their microfinance entity. And we particularly focus on um, tier four microfinance institutions. So circles, village savings groups, uh, credit institutions, really what you would otherwise call emerging microfinance institutions. Uh, a lot of people in Uganda, when you talk about circles, they really think about small groups of people that meet under a tree somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> so those are actually not circles. Those are what you call village savings groups. Mm -hmm. These are groups of people, about 30 people that meet. Those are also our customers, but this particular segment of customers that I'm talking about, circles are more institutional savings and credit cooperatives. So they have an office, they have professional staff. The formal Yeah, they're like, you office. know, they have a banking hall. Mm -hmm. like you can walk mm -hmm. in there and be served by someone at the till, uh, but they are not a bank. Neither are they a formal microfinance entity. They are not a deposit. Well, they are deposit taking because. But only for their members. But only for their members. So it's member owned. Mm. So that's really how they operate. Okay, so you yeah. charge like a monthly subscription fee? Yeah, so we. Our business model is what they call software as a service. So we charge a monthly fee for every account that the institution has on our platform. So if they have a thousand members or a thousand customers, that is a thousand accounts for us. Wow. So we charge a monthly fee on each of those accounts. And you know, that's really all that we charge for the institutions. Okay, that's yeah. good to know. Sure. So how do you choose your customers? Our customers are categorized. So you are either a circle, so you're a member-owned financial institution, or you are an emerging microfinance institution. So you'll find maybe in a rural area somewhere, there's a credit institution that only provides loans, they don't take deposits, and they're privately owned. And then you have what you call village savings groups, but most village savings groups under work, work under certain aggregating organization. So this could be a community-based organization that works with groups of people that save money together and loan each other. So we segment our customers into three distinct categories. And we have the same business model for all of them, but we target each of them differently. Mm. Yeah. Do you face infrastructure challenges working in rural areas with internet? Our technology and our, our platform relies heavily on, on infrastructure. First of all, they need to have physical infrastructure. They need a computer mm. if you're to access our platform. And then you need power. And then you need internet connectivity. Now, we, to a certain extent, solve two of those issues. Now, power is completely out of our domain, so we don't do a lot about it. We, have, we do have solar partners that we recommend our customers to, so we point oh. them to the right places. We're not really involved in solving that problem directly. But we are involved in solving the other two, which is really the hardware infrastructure required for them to use our platform and the internet connectivity that they need to, to use the platform. Wow, yeah. it's great that you took that initiative because those would be the roadblocks for you having more customers. They are, and they are indeed. Uh, and as a business, uh, I think it's important for businesses to always identify some of the barriers for them to scale and get their product to market and make sure that you have uh, a strategy for how you can get those addressed. And that's what my business 
uh, has has been able to do. Yeah, yeah, impressive. Sure, thank you. So how did you come up with this whole idea? Do you have an IT background, uh, finance background? No, so I'm a non-tech founder of a tech company. Oh. So I have no background in technology at all. I used to work for a non-profit. Mm -hmm. uh, and I used to teach entrepreneurship. So my motivation for starting the business really had to do with two things. One was my background. I grew up in the village with a single mother. And my mother started the circle many years back. Mm. So I saw my mother's experience with the circle and I saw how impactful the circle was to her and people in my community. So this was something that I was, I, I was always curious about and somehow passionate about. Uh, then I taught entrepreneurship for about four years when I worked with this non-profit institution. So I knew that at some point I wanted to be an entrepreneur and when I had the opportunity to do that, I wanted to do something about circles. Mm. Uh, so in 2014, I quit my job. I used to work with Educate, which is a non-profit ah. here. So I quit my job in 2014. I teamed up with a friend of mine and we started in Sivuko in, in 2014. And we knew for sure that circles and microfinance, financial services generally, or financial inclusion, was something that we wanted to do something about. Yeah. So why do the circles and the microfinance banks need you? What advantage are they getting from going digital? Most circles, when you walk into a circle, a typical circle that isn't digitized, what you see is files and heaps of paper. And people have to dig through those files just to perform one single task, mm. even just to write a report for their regulator because they're now regulated institutions. And every month they're required to submit financial reports. Wow, is it and you, month? Yeah, and you can imagine they have to go through all this paper. Someone has to go through all this paper to prepare those reports. So it's a lot of work. So what we do is make their work easy, right? So all they need to do is enter data onto our platform and we do the rest of the work for them. We process everything, we queue everything. The reports are just a click away. So they, they become more efficient, they become more organized, uh, their work is much easier. The people that they serve have more confidence in the institution because they're automated. Do you have a background with working with businesses to this point? In Educate, you were teaching teenagers, I understand, yes. is what Educate does. Yes. So how did you learn how to run your own business? I, I had very early experiences with entrepreneurship. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I grew up with a single mother mm. and I was the only son. The community where I grew up from, um, there was always pressure for young men to kind of own a kraal for you to be an adult. And, and my, my mother was kind of my very early mentor. Uh, and you know, she supported most of my early dreams of entrepreneurship. I remember my first business was a small um, piece of land where I planted tomatoes at the backyard of my mother's house. And I harvested about one basin full and I sold it for 2,500 shillings. That was the first money that I ever earned. And I was very excited about this and I started to do a few other odd things that uh, young people in rural areas do, you know, bricklaying, I did charcoal burning, and I started up to save up money. And then I started a small stall just at the front of our house, selling tomatoes and cooking oil and things like that. And what do you like about being an entrepreneur? Um, I think entrepreneurship, first of all, really gives you the opportunity to solve a problem that you are truly passionate about. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to help other people. Uh, it could be your customers or it could be the people that work with you. There are people that you know, work with you, uh, their families depend on them. And so you know, the resources that the, the business has you know, pays them enough to be able to take care of their families. I think for me it's truly fulfilling to know that you're creating employment for other people, but that you're also solving a real problem that uh, affects the lives of many people in community. I think for me, that that's one of the most fulfilling things about being an entrepreneur. Would you encourage your friends or your peers to also become entrepreneurs? I don't think that everyone should be an entrepreneur. Yeah. I think that people could be entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs. I think you can innovate within an already existing business. I think that people should generally be uh, able to initiate and innovate it, and it doesn't matter whether you're innovating within a business that you're, you set up on your own or within an already existing business that someone else has, been set, has, mm. has put in place. How would you describe being a business owner? What does it feel like? You know, running an enterprise or being an entrepreneur is one of the most difficult things. It's fulfilling 
it's exciting but it's not easy at all it comes a lot of fears it comes a lot of pressures a lot of anxieties so many failures and if you're not firm and strong enough you could very easily give up mm. um, but you always need to find a balance and you need to find a way of refreshing yourself and motivating yourself because so many times you won't have uh, other people motivating you the motivation for you to keep doing what you do really comes from within yeah. Mm. Yeah. what activities do you think you would advise young people to engage in that they can do now to make them better for the future or to make them better prepared for business since you've grown up trying different businesses and having that experience the journey of entrepreneurship is really about trying new things mm. and experimenting and that involves being uh, comfortable with failure right so a lot of times you will initiate things even now I, I initiate a lot of things within my business. Some of them don't go well, mm -hmm. but you always have to be able to pick up yourself and try something else. But I also think that uh, young people should be able to grow their social networks, so really make friends, because I think that friendships and find, making the right relationships is one of the things that has significantly contributed to my business. I think young people should be investing in relationships, so find opportunities where you can meet interesting people, right? Mm. It could be forums, workshops, events, it could be exhibitions, but really, you know, make inten intentionally, you know, make friends and, you know, get business cards, reach out to people, thank, thank them for, you know, that conversation that you had with them previously, really find a meaningful way to keep that relationship going. Mm. Um, I think that you know, for me, and then of course, knowledge, I think, enriching yourself, whether it's reading or watching. I don't particularly like to read, but I like to watch. Mm -hmm. So I always look for things that I think are very enriching for me that I can watch in my free time. And I encourage young people to really, you know, expose themselves to new knowledge and new things and new ideas, because then, you, you know, you, there's a lot of things that you learn there, and there's a lot of motivation and inspiration that you get from doing that. And what approach do you use when you have a challenge? When I have a challenge, something that I find a lot of difficulty with you know, in the business, I always invite people into my office mm -hmm. and I present them this challenge. Then I let them uh, speak about the challenge and you know, share a lot of ideas. And the whole time, I just keep quiet and write. I, I always think faster and think better when I listen to people. Mm. So I sit down, I write. I don't really expect to get answers from those meetings, but it helps get my mind thinking. So you learned this about your own process? Yes, I, this is my own process. This is how I perform better. And that's what I do with my business. It's been so great learning from Gerald from Insubuko. Let's take a quick break. Welcome back to Business Revolution. We're here with Gerald from Insibuko and we're learning a lot about his entrepreneurship journey and some of the skills and tools he uses in his business. Gerald, so you mentioned that you've now grown to the size of 40 employees over the last five years. Yeah. So from your experience as an entrepreneur, have you struggled to learn to delegate, to train, to trust your employees to do exactly what you would want to do for the business? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's always difficult to let go of control. Mm. You know, there's, there's always the temptation to want to keep everything and do everything on your own. And this is something that I personally struggled with for a long time. But actually what helped me was honest employees. Mm. So I have this one person in my business that's really honest with me and gives me honest feedback. And, um, and one of the things she continuously tells me or used to tell me because I've made lots of improvements since is the fact that I was a micromanager. <laughs> so I was always going down to the details and I wanted a lot of control and I was involved in literally everything that everyone was doing. Uh, but that feedback and continuously speaking with her and you know it allowed me to let go of mo most of these things and you know, now I, f I feel better that people can take charge of things and I don't really have to know every, every single detail of it. And, and that people, I only keep the most important things to myself. Uh, I have learned that uh, getting work done through others actually makes more, me more efficient and gets a lot of work done. So I found that particularly to be very useful. And you feel like you've made the strides now, you're good at it. I, I think I have. I'm aware about the things and you know, I'm, I'm making the deliberate effort 
to uh, make sure that I, I, I delegate most of the things that I need to delegate. Mm. And that I recognize that really my role as CEO and founder of the company is to set the direction and get people motivated to get things done. Oh, not yeah. so much the technical aspect. Yeah, I don't think that I should be involved in it as much as... I mean, of course, as, as, you know, as, as founder sometimes for a technical company, you might want to you know, contribute to the technical vision Mm. Uh, of the company, so really what's the direction of our technology and things like that, but getting into the details of you know, how features are being built, how bugs are being fixed, a lot of those details, there are people within the team that you know, should mm. be managing that. And what do you think should be regulated? Do you think you should be regulated something similar to the finance industry or is it more about business or is it tech on its own because you have a lot of data and there's issues with privacy? I think it should be tech. There are certain, like I mentioned earlier, there are certain regulations that touch us. So for example, last this year actually, there was a new uh, data privacy and protection bill that was passed law. Mm. Uh, and we have to be compliant with that. Um, I think that a lot of the regulations should be really around tech and data because there's a lot of financial technologies and financial services that are now mobile driven and all of that. And there has to be some kind of regulation to make sure that things are done properly yeah. within that sector. But the regulation has to be in designed in a way that it doesn't uh, deter uh, innovators from innovating and trying new things. So yeah, it could also be down. very counterproductive if it's not done properly. Hmm. How you hire and how you build teams, because I think that this is one of the most challenging things for an entrepreneur. Mm. Uh, hiring decision, you know, you could make a really terrible hiring de decision that could cost you a lot and could very easily kill your business. But you could also get it right. That's, we always want to get it right, but it's mm. difficult for me personally as an entrepreneur. And I wonder if this is an experience that you, you have yourself. I think it's the most important thing because businesses are run by people. So mm. if you hire right, half the work is done. But how do you know? Mm, so we have two ways we do it, with the interview process and then also with probation. So everyone who gets hired in Simba Group has three months probation before you're given a contract. Because within three months you can see if the person actually lives up to what their CV says, what they did in the interview, what they say they're capable of, and if they can fit in the company culture, in the structure, in the team, in the role, in the department that they've been hired for. Mm -hmm. So that helps us a lot. Within three months, the person can feel it, you can also feel it, you can discuss, improve here, see this or not, and most of the time it works out. With hiring, um, I do a lot of the interviews myself once they've been through the line managers. Because it's important to get the feel of someone, not just a CV or an application or a cover letter or a recommendation. Okay. But away from the Simba group, mm. you think about, let's say, Musana Cuts, like from the the context of a startup like us we don't we don't usually have those much standards and processes and you know but it's good things. to have the context of the big structure even for the small companies because yeah. then you have better governance from the beginning yeah. so the same principles i used to hire in simba group I hire in musana mm -hmm. so like first for an established business you set like your annual an, annual goals like the targets kpis are very clear for the year for a startup you set them but those could very easily change mm. in two months right uh, so you hire someone and you are, they are very clear KPIs for the year and those are the KPIs that you're going to be using to measure their performance. Mm. But as you run the business, you realize that you have to make changes. And so you make changes and that means that their KPIs also do change. Yeah. So it kind of alters, you know, uh, the big plan. The, the, the big plan. Uh, how, how are you able to, if you think about it from the context of a startup, mm. how are you able to accommodate that but still be able to Call people accountable to high performance and measure them against the KPIs that the company has set and all the changing KPIs that, you know? Um, firstly, I always make KPIs with the person. Okay. I don't think it's good form to write a list of targets for someone and just hand it to them and walk away and expect them to do it. Mm -hmm. So we sit together and agree, what are you working on right now? How efficient do you think you are? What are your challenges? How can the company support you? And now, what are your goals this month? Is this realistic? How are you actually going to achieve it? I think the difference with hiring in startups and in big companies is you need someone who's more a team player and is flexible. Mm -hmm. 
Because in a big company, you can have someone technically specific to their role and they're busy and that's what they do. But in a startup, everyone sort of needs to help each other out. Sometimes in Musana, the accountant will be there in the field on the cart, helping to count the cash or to pass bags to this person or to bring more stock. Like you have to have that kind of attitude of when the team needs me, I'll step up and help even though that's not my core role and position. Because yeah, yeah. that also helps as things change and move. And it saves you from having to terminate someone because now the goals have changed and now you don't need that person. Mm -hmm. But they also had skills and they were helping in this department, so maybe they can help on this side. Mm -hmm. Every time uh, I meet entrepreneurs, one of the questions they always ask is capital and fundraising. <laughs> it's, it's, I get that question a lot. The number one question, um, what is your challenge? No capital. It's, it's always a question that I struggle with the most mm. because for me, I feel like there is no actual formula for how to raise capital. And yet there's a lot of programs, you know, that a lot <laughs> of programs around, tell you that. around fundraising and how to fundraise and all of this. I have had difficulty localizing the conversation around fundraising and raising capital to local entrepreneurs here. So I always tell them that the only way to raise money is to really uh, invest in yourself because people invest in people. The times that I've raised money for my business, it's always been that the people believe in me as a mm. person, right? Um, but what, what's been your own experience, particularly for Musana Cats? I also get that question a lot. and. I totally understand the things they teach you. Like I went to school in San Francisco, to business mm -hmm. school. So all the Silicon Valley things were like entrenched in me. You have to do this, you have to do this. It has to sound like this, it has to mm -hmm. look like this. And it just doesn't apply here. The market is completely different. The demand is different, the supply is different. And there's a big gap also for startups here in Uganda because there they have money to waste on failing mm -hmm. and they believe in failing fast. It's not a waste, it's an mm -hmm. investment because mm -hmm. we're going to learn. Mm -hmm. But they have the ability to burn money like that. Mm -hmm. And here we're we just not in that it. kind of context. Yeah. Yeah. So no one is encouraged, just try it and we'll see if it doesn't work out, it's okay, you'll get more money. Mm -hmm. So I think to reframe that for local entrepreneurs is a big challenge. And most successful entrepreneurs in Uganda have grown organically. They didn't have grants, they didn't have big injections of seed capital. They had to do it the old fashioned way. You sell more than you spend. That mm -hmm. is it. Mm -hmm. And what you're saying about the person is, I think, the most important part. And with some of the interviews we've done here for Business Revolution with the older generation of entrepreneurs, they say, you never have to chase money. You never have to chase customers. You never have to chase funding. As long as you're doing the right thing, it will find you. you Quality, you in that? character, if you, keep, if you know your product is good and you're providing the service that your customers need, the funding will keep finding you. Mm. I always um, encourage entrepreneurs to start with what you have. Mm. Then you'll figure out if your product is exactly what the market needs. Mm. Is it the right quality? Is it the right service? Is it the right customers? Once you find that area, then things start to flow. And the funny thing is, once it rains, it pours. So once you start to get momentum, that's when everything happens. We struggled with Musana at the beginning, and then we went through a period where every day someone is calling you for an interview, for an award, you should apply for this grant, we'd like to fund you, we'd like to come and film you, we'd want to do this, because it all just happens so fast once you, you figure out that click mm -hmm. and that right part. But I don't think it's something you can just pick and drop and it translates. But isn't the process of finding market fit for the product itself expensive? And isn't this the reason some of the startups are looking for funding? because mm. you have to really understand the market and that sometimes means that you have to have a product, get the market to use it, test uh, price, pricing models and business models very early on and iterate but as it shouldn't be as want. expensive because if you're doing the right thing and you're in the right sector, you're also earning money at that time. Yeah. So if people are buying your product and saying this is good but improve it this way, you're on the right track. If no one is buying it, you can't afford to just keep making different versions. Yeah. Okay, try this one. Okay, try this one. Okay, try this one. Mm -hmm. There's something you're doing that's wrong. There's a mm -hmm. fundamental piece you're missing. Either the price or the product or the market. You have to understand these things. Which is why I also say research is very important. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, so many young people start a business because they see someone has this business. They don't know what it has taken to get that business to that level. Mm -hmm. You don't know if that person's had it for 10 years. You don't know what they're doing, how their customers interact with them, where they find their customers, how they're ensuring the quality is at a standard level. Mm -hmm. They just want to dive in. So you need to assess your market, assess the pricing, assess the competitors, understand the pain point that you're mm -hmm. solving. Mm -hmm. I think, and then you'll save a lot more time and energy because you'll get ahead. You'll start 
with a bit of an advantage because you know what you're doing. And I get this question a lot of times. When is the right time mm. to become an entrepreneur? I get this from people that are employed. I get this from people that are just leaving university and are trying to make a decision whether or not they should pursue a career or should become an entrepreneur. I think that every entrepreneur, everyone has their own timing and the things that trigger the entrepreneurial spirit within you are different for everyone. Uh, for me, mm. I first had to be employed for four years. That's when my trigger point actually happened. For other people, it's, it's completely different. I think that there's never a right time for you to be an entrepreneur than now, mm -hmm. right? As long as you feel deep within your heart that you want to be one and that this is what you want to pursue and you have something you're passionate about, you have, um, you're willing to take the risk because entrepreneurship is really about taking risks. Uh, being able to do something when there is no sure, there's, there's no guarantee that it's gonna work, mm. right? That's what makes entrepreneurship exciting. Mm. A lot of the entrepreneurs here have a plan A, a plan B and C, right? So they have this idea, this is what they really wanna do. And they always have another side gig in case this doesn't work, then I can jump from here to that. When I quit my job, I gave myself just one route and I had no other way to go. So I knew that my life really depended on it. <laughs> so it had to succeed. Yeah, so for me, one of my mentors told me that it will never be successful until you feel that your life depends on it. So for me, and Sibuko is really my life, right? This is all I do 100% of my time. So if I'm not doing this, I'm doing nothing. Mm -hmm. And I think that that really is where I find my motivation. I, ca I can't afford to give up because I have no other thing to do if I don't do this. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. And thank you for making the time to come sure. and speak to thank us today. Thank you too. Appreciate Learned it. a lot. It's been interesting to get the perspective from a fintech founder in Uganda and the different challenges and solutions that he has found have worked for him. Thank you so much for making the time, Gerald. Thank you. I'm Natalie Bititure, and this is Business Revolution. Mm -hmm.